openly commit to reading Reaper's Gale this month. Say that you're going to do spoiler talks for each one of the books and absolutely have it on time with the rest of your TBR. Reaper's Gale won't be that too bad. <laughs> you got through the rest of them, this one should just be easy peasy. There's no reason why Mike's book review stopped on it. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. My name is Sean and today we are finally getting back into Malazan with a spoiler talk of book one of Reaper's Gale. If you don't watch my TBR videos or my update videos, I decided that for Reaper Scale, I was going to do things a little bit differently. So instead of just reading the entire book in one go and then just doing one massive spoiler video about it, where I have to edit down increasing amounts of time from like an hour, hour and a half, two hours worth of content to something semi-coherent and well edited, I decided that we were going to do a very loose, just me talking about book one of Reaper Scale, and I'll be doing that for each of the books in here. So it may still take me a while to get that full on chunky video out there that hopefully by doing this, I can bring down to 30 minutes, but this is just a way that I can try to hit more of the individual points and leave less out. And then when I finally do actually make the final video, then my thoughts are in a lot more order because trying to get everything settled just takes me a while and that's why i'll take like two to three weeks after finishing it just to do that video not even me actually working on it that's just how long it takes for me to like actually figure out what i thought about the book so this is going to be interesting hopefully you enjoy it but i'm just going to go down chapter by chapter kind of highlight some things i want to talk about dialing down some characters i'm going to try to keep this 20 to 30 minutes long and then i'll just cut out any dead space but if you've noticed the lack of editing that's why just imagine i did a zoom into my face and then just like confetti popped out because not doing it this time <laughs> zoom and wink but there is also because it generally takes me a couple of weeks to get my mind sorted and what i actually thought about this Book. I don't have any strong impressions on this so far. Book one was actually fairly hard for me to get into, but historically it's taken me about 10, 11 chapters to get into each Malazan book. That's Now that is kind of crazy because we're already a couple hundred to 300 pages in the book, but these books get so chunky that by the time I get into it, I still have like two thirds of the book left to enjoy. What I can say, general thoughts about this book so far is that it seems like we're still having more and more complexity added in there. We had some really badass characters introduced just in this book one. We're learning a lot more about sort of the lore and history and you're just seeing more things set up for the horizon. So I'm fully expecting by the time this book wraps up just this massive, epic, giant conglomeration of things that are just going to completely blow my mind just because there are so many people who are such diehard fans of this. So... I can't imagine it not paying off for me, but book one, we're still setting up pieces and adding new players to the board. So it's an interesting choice because we're on book seven so far. So you would think by now things would start to, you know, start moving towards the ultimate convergence, but we keep having more things added on there, more empathy added to certain characters. Other characters are giving more depth. So I can appreciate what's been happening so far. <laughs> I won't know if I've enjoyed it or not until after I'm done with it because Malazan is not the book series that I just like enjoy a moment start to finish. I fully appreciate it, but this is like high level, like the enjoyment of it for me is putting thing ever together and that satisfaction of like, I got through it. But getting into the chapters, the prologue of this book was actually one of my favorite prologues. We keep hearing more and more about the dragons, more and about the Kachank Jamel, just these things keep getting set up. And I've actually haven't been a huge fan of most of the Malazan prologues so far, mainly because I don't have the context to fully understand them. There's a lot of detail I recognize that are nice little Easter eggs for people who know the series and certain characters that looking back, I can think back on like, Trolls prologue and knowing what I know about Troll now, then that would have been like a really fun little thing, but experience most of these for the first time. Kind of hit or miss for me, but this one we start diving into more of the Elder Gods, sort of seeing the interplay between them, getting into Kilimandaros, which 
for Cool of Sail are just absolutely terrifying and so many things happen like in the series I forget like those are another player so once again massive convergence coming but getting to see more about how they handled Skavandari and just the interaction between the Elder Gods just is very interesting. We still don't quite know their game, how the Cripple God plays into that, how dragons play into that. So just seeing more and more light put on this I thought was pretty exciting. It was also cool seeing Anamander Rake again and just seeing how he can just continuously be the cool badass character delivering like cool line after cool line to kill him in Daros. And we got to be introduced to Red Mask who you don't get a lot of him in this chapter so far but in book one I think he may be the most interesting character that we have so far with the exception of maybe still just Ruin. But just having a mysterious figure show up wearing a scaled mask and having what looks dragony or dinosaur-y companions falling on there just interest immediately picked. Getting into chapter one, this is where I start to get a little bit lost and it wasn't until after I've gotten further on there that I was able to kind of piece together what happened, but you just immediately dropped into newly conquered Leather and Leather is a very interesting place because I think it might be possibly the most like normal human one or if you're looking for like an American stand-in for where that would be in the Malazan Empire. I think it'd be hard not to choose the super capitalistic society that focus on wealth acquisition but basically since they've been conquered you just have a groups of people that are trying to seize power, the patriotists, and they are using secret police and McCarthy-like tactics just to do whatever they can to help their new overlords just so they can just scratch out whatever power they can get. And it's set up in a really interesting way because we finally see Tehul and Bug again in here. So having Tehul just being the mad genius mastermind that he is, and now knowing that like Bug is actually male and he has access to all of the Elder God things, I'm really excited to see how that's going to play because they're all set up in a scene where you know Tehul can just completely go off and mix in with all these different patriotists in this new city-state. So... That right now, other than Red Mask, I think are the things I'm most excited about about this book. You also see the introduction, and unless they were mentioned earlier and I just missed them, but Lather trying to conquer the Aldan and just the way they're spreading sort of rumors and propaganda just to make them look out to be these horrific things just so they can go on and wholesale slaughter everything from like the kids to the dogs to just any Aldan there. A lot of stuff being set up and a lot of parallels to just how war happens and how we've never set crazy propaganda on stuff to initiate a profitable war so we can slaughter a bunch of people. Definitely not. But you're having a lot of cool little pieces set up for conflicts within this book. I don't think we're going to have the grand convergence in this book, but I'm very interested to see how a lot of these things are going to collide. Also get reintroduced back into Silchas Ruins group. They're saving... Udanas and Kettle and a few others from slavers and you're once again reminded by just how bleak the Malazan world is. The fact that they were captured, beaten, tortured, Kettle got sexually assaulted, just so many things in a short mind and it was just so matter of fact for them. You know that's not the first time so it was just real crazy just to have that constant reminder of just how bleak this place is. I always think back to like that Daniel Green sketch where he's like talking about Malazan and it's just like a high pace like you know who do you think the good guys are and there are no good guys there's no bad guys there's only shades of gray and it's this book so far in this first chapter really showcased that. You're also introduced into several characters that I very much don't like Tanal being at the top of it but <laughs> he will continuously come up just being a sadistic piece of shit. So we'll talk about more about him later. Chapter two. Speaking of Tanal, the thing that I actually really enjoyed about it, because in the first book, you just see him being a sadistic piece of shit that is torturing people and just really gross things about how like prisoners like being beaten and just how you can win them over. And like, if they want the attention is that you meet Janeth who despite her, completely messed up scenario seems to just have a constant mental upper hand against him and it's just torturing him with just facts and logic and just really using psychology to get into his head so really don't like Tanal so far like Janeth 
even though she's in such a bad situation, but just watching her just do mental circles around her capture and torture was fun to see. This book too, you're getting more into some of the history. You're learning more about the Kachanj Kamal and how there was actually dragons who came and started messing up their stuff. So we know there was a civil war with like the short tails versus the long tails. Don't really know anything about that but now we're finding out that dragons were somehow involved and also resulting in a lot of the destructions of some of their like major sky keeps which is interesting because dragons have so much to do in these series but we just really haven't like dived deep into them and how they play into everything we know there's a lot of tie-in and stuff and just symmetry in the series so I'm really curious just how they play in. How does that work with like the soul taken? Because you have like rake and ruin that can become dragons. Is that the same thing? But just so many dragon questions I have on here. <laughs> I'm really excited to dive more into. This book has a lot of philosophy in it too. And I'm going to save my kind of analysis or thoughts on that. But you're seeing Udinas talk about his slavery with like fear who a lot of the test editor blame him specifically for not being there to keep rule at saying but you're having kind of a back and forth of just like should he have stayed was he wrong for leaving the mad demented person that has now led them all into just chaos and war but so far getting six chapters into that there's been a lot of pondering about like war and just general philosophizing and I think that's going to be a big focus of the big video, but let's just say Soul Jazz Ruin and his group have a lot of bickering, a lot of argument, and a lot of debating just what it is to be alive, war is war good, and general things about slavery and everything else. It's It'll be a fun dive. We get a lot more of Red Mask in this one, and now we know that he actually is from the Aldon Nation and that he likes to carve faces off. So. Don't know a lot about him except that he wears a mask, uses ancient weapons that no Aldan has used in generations, and also is surrounded by two Kachan Jamal and is just like viciously murdering people in very savage ways. And my interest is absolutely peaked for this character. It's kind of reminiscing of like Karsa with like that just brutal savagery and just him leaving like this like completely different way of life with a tribe to come more into the cities. And there's a lot of introspection and philosophy that goes between like how he thinks about what it's like to actually get into that civilizing influences but he is not a civilized person whatsoever there's a parallel later in this book about like the lathri and you know will the tist editor actually get poisoned by like the lathri ways that like hunger for wealth and greed and stuff with that going to mess up with their whole society of like honor or just taint whatever they had going on before the cripple got cut involved but you definitely see that parallel too with like the aldan just because they are also being exterminated by the lethary but there was definitely some overlap with just culture that's happening there one of the big mic drops in this too was kettle has the ability to speak to the dead we find out that the crippled god does not want to start the big conflict yet with the west malzan and all of them so there's still secrets hiding in the east so we know he still has some like really crazy plots going on and he's trying to lead Rulad a certain way and we know that Karsa and Ikrim are on their way to it so it's just interesting to see where that's going to fall into the plan maybe that's going to be the catalyst but a lot of interesting stuff's happening with Ulad that we'll get into in the next chapters. Chapter 3. This was a lot more focused on Rulad and just the Tisteter's ruling of Lethary and I thought it was really interesting because we didn't really see Rulad other than just a lot of kind of like hints and little glimpses in the previous book so getting back into them it was interesting. We finally got that flashback to when Troll actually gets shorn. And it seems like Rulad just continuously gets wrapped up in these like really desperate moments of madness where he just like lashes out. But then you'll see him sobbing in like the quieter moments and just like and full of like pain and nightmares and just like begging for forgiveness from all these people. And there is a recurring theme in Malazan of just like empathy and forgiveness. And so just ruin and later on in this book has a line that you know, there's a difference between being the god of evil and the god of pain, and it seems to feel more pity for the crippled god than actual, like, hate, and Rulad is definitely a smaller reflection of that, but now having that context of, like, troll and seeing what, like, just 
and honestly badass he was seeing him just kind of go in there drop his spear and just try to show like the kindness or that if you watch the Van Lan Sangre like that I have no enemies type of approach to Rulad was just super powerful and knowing the after effects of that it was cool just to see it but there is a absolute battle for power within Rulad's court even though he is just absolutely insane and probably just full of chaos and just so many unknown variables people are still trying to vie for power in there you're seeing that too with the lethary police state that has been forming you know rather than actually try to do the best for their people after being conquered they're just doing whatever they can to continuously acquire wealth and just put themselves ahead even though they're responsible for the people so kind of like fuck those guys we're gonna get money but Nisal had a interesting observation of Rulad and how he's still a child at mind, even though he is just like constantly suffering. But he's basically dying at every night at this point. So just the amount of torment and suffering he has to be going through is just mind boggling. And it's going to be interesting to see when they reconverge back after he has some time to really ferment in that madness. But we got some glimpses into what he's trying to do with these new champions. You know, we, there was a Tarthanol in the arena that he fought seven times, and the Tarthanol killed him, you know, <laughs> six times, and he just kept coming back stronger and stronger. So that really opens up a lot of questions, like, what's going to happen when you have, like, Ikram, who is known, who was, like, in the deck of dragons, the same thing with Karsa, who was, like, the champion of the Grippled God. Is it going to be a quick use him and, like, get out of here, Rulad? Or is there some kind of like power that's being charged into the sword? Or what are you going to have when you have these unstoppable force meet the unmovable object? So I'm still very excited to see what that big confrontation is going to look like. Or even if it's going to like happen. What's going to happen when Karthus and Ikram meet? To... So, so many just unanswered questions that I keep popping up. Chapter 4, this was a bit of a shorter chapter. Or at least I have less to say about it. But once again... Silchas Ruins group is just full of people getting mad at each other and bickering. It's kind of starting to drag at this point, but Udenas is definitely resentful of how all the Tist Adder treat him and the responsibility of him being a slave to Rulad and how he should have stayed. And it's kind of like, is that my problem? This is not my problem. Once again, I'll be diving into philosophy in my bigger video. But you're seeing more of the group and kind of fleshing out some of these characters. And one, just how badass Silchas Ruin is. I mean, you knew about him facing off with Scavendari against the Kachan and Shamel and just the amount of damage they were doing and just how crazy that war must have been. And being the half-brother to Animander, you know, that's a really badass character. But Silchas Ruin now is coming off as like a much colder version of Animander, which is terrifying, but also super cool there was some little hints dropped in about how like he can't just turn into his draconic form because that's going to awaken the hunger and bloodlust so once again we're getting into that whole dragon mechanics that i just really want to know a lot more about but we're not getting those details just yet just kind of dropped and dropped and dropped but there was an interesting moment with Saren where she was trying to debate whether or not like is it my problem if i stop him from going and slaughtering a full garrison and she decides it's not, but then he'll just go and slaughter an entire garrison. So just another unbelievably powerful person in this universe that you don't really know how stacks up against each other. There's some talk about like how the Cripple God would not be ready for them if there was a direct confrontation. So where does that all fit into everything? And I mentioned it earlier, but this was the chapter actually where Solchis was showing empathy for the crippled god and how he doesn't hate him or what he's doing, but how being the god of pain is not the same as being the god of evil. So despite the cold just sort of slaughter of people and just what we've seen in the moment of the series so far, he still is able to show empathy and just kind of strive for a bit more, which is a very interesting counterpoint to slaughtering a garrison full of lethary people. <laughs> Seeing a lot more of Red Mask in this chapter too, once again fleshing him out as a very interesting character. I think I'm just really fascinated whenever you get into the noble savage type of archetype, even though Erickson will generally subvert all these archetypes, but it's one I've always been particularly drawn to and thought was interesting. So having him go back and trying to challenge Hot Dress to 
become the war leader of the Aldan was very interesting. Red Mask accuses, you know, him of just being completely influenced by the Lethri and just being a coward and how they need to go back to the old ways. Decides that, like, some of the people he's taking over are just too weak, so they do, like, the Death Knight ceremony, which does not sound fun. And having that eventual confrontation where just with the sheer power of what the old ways are and just using kind of how far that Hadron had like actually fallen, it just winds up with like the tribe just completely slaughtering him without him having to do much other than just simply talk. But that whole confrontation was just really crazy because you have like tens of thousands of like all warriors just right behind like their war leader. Red Mask comes up, starts accusing them all of cowardice and they're like, why would we even like humor any of this? just to have the two Kachain come out of nowhere and then just like, oh, what's uh, what's happening here? But you have him just take over the tribe at that point and a lot of interesting things follow from that. Chapter five, we have even more characters introduced that I have no context for. There seems to be a mysterious, some sort of ascendant that just rejoined the mortal world. Sounds like it's not been the first time. Just we know what eats people and it has diluted tist edder blood running through it and just seems to be aware of a lot of things happening, which is kind of interesting for something that just rejoined the world. But more unknown characters being dropped in here that I hope have like big payoffs. <laughs> One thing, too, and I've like cut out a lot of the things that I have said in here, but there are so many like POVs that will just show up to help illustrate a point, but being so early in the series, I just never know if that's going to be a major character or not. So like you'll have like a Lethry sh Shepherd that shows up, he's a named character, kind of showcases something just to like have himself like killed three scenes later. <laughs> it's just really interesting to see who to pay attention to, but I think the mysterious swamp monster that has emerged from the depths is probably here to stay for a little bit. We did finally get to see with Dahl and Bug sort of how that new dynamic is going to work. Male Bug is giving Tehul a lot of information that he just would not have access to any other way. And Tehul is absolutely a planner and he had a line about you like, you just give me all the facts and I'll just use my little plithy mortal mind to put this all together. And we're finally seeing that happen with them. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Tehul can do when he is supercharged with information now from an elder god. <laughs> You see him too later on messing with the new chief of secret police, Karos. I didn't mention before, but he has like a love of puzzles and like, you know, Tahal starts actually messing with him by sending him like puzzle boxes. So you think there's going to be a big confrontation between the two of them, you know, puzzle loving secret police member that's trying to root out just all the things that are going against the newly formed empire versus one guy who likes to make a lot of puns and has overthrown the economy multiple times. So what's going to happen? On a less fun note, we go back to Tenal and his prisoner, Janeth. And just Janeth is continually getting under her skin. Like I've said before, I think she is a super cool character. I like her as much as I dislike Tenal, but... She just completely gets under his skin where he just like beats her unconscious and then just still he is haunted by like the words. So, you know, he she is just psychologically wrecking him while he is physically wrecking her. So don't really like him. I'm curious where that's going to go. I mean, she is obviously a very well intellectually capable character. So it'll be interesting to see at, at some point she gets free or join forces with Taho, what that mind is going to look like when now it's like firmly directed at just the secret police and just people of Lethry that are trying to repress everyone with their new secret police McCarthyism tactics. So don't know where this is going yet. So far, this part's pretty depressing, but I'm hoping for fire and vengeance pretty soon because really don't like Tenno. You're also starting to see more gods start to get together and plot and plan. You see Shadow Throne and Hood go and meet with like Minodore and just... I'm probably mispronouncing a lot of these names. Minodore? Minodore? Minodore. But you're seeing certain secret alliances being made, traits being happening, and we know Shadow Throne is quite the schemer, but we don't know how he plays into this book just yet or what's really happening. So just wanted to mention that just so I have... A reference of saying like Shadow Throne is doing Shadow Throne things and I'm pretty excited to see where that goes. Also turns out that Queen Janal is still alive though just channeling the Cripple God's power has turned her into a just 
giant bloated disgusting what I imagine to be similar to Jabba the Hutt type creature who is also insane and she has a whole debate with just the philosophy of just whether or not you want the attention of the gods that you're praying to with the crippled god but something I think is more interesting to actually talk about in a more highly edited video. You really get to dive back into the new politics that's happening in there, the fight for Roulette's court, and just seeing all like the kind of insanity and hidden daggers and the shadows in this. So really interesting to see what's going to happen there. There seems to be factions forming of people who like, like Roulette and want to help them versus people who are just really out to get their own sort of slices of power. So knowing Malazan so far, you really don't know who's going to win and what's going to happen with that. So it's kind of like I want to cheer for these guys, but... There's also probably something weird and twisted also happening with these guys, so who will see? I think my just general who I think is a good guy, bad guy now is like who shows remotely any empathy whatsoever. I think my basic just who is a good guy, bad guy, it's just who shows any empathy whatsoever now. So let's go for Rulad's empathy fun kindness team. Chapter 6. So this, so far, actually, I think was my favorite chapter. You get some old characters reintroduced to get more into like what's happening with the Red Mask. And then you also start to have some heavy foreshadowing just of like people making assumptions that's absolutely going to bite them in their face. But to start things out, we know there's going to be an impending war with like the Alden and like the Lethry and one of the commanders, Bivat, who is talking about like the actual threat that the Alden is going to show. I actually like wrote this down. But she was like, oh, we're going to completely win this. They all are just like super divisive. Red Mask just united all of them. Red Mask only likes to like raid and ambush things. He doesn't have like a full on army. And it's like, uh, don't, don't think that's going to be what's going to happen. And also it's like Red Mask and they all never change their tactics. We already know how to beat them. And we have a full on Red Mask monologue just about how they're completely going to have to do war differently if they want to actually win against the Lethary. So... You have a very arrogant commander that just is probably going to get smacked in the face with something that she was not expecting. And part of that too is back at Red Matt's camp now that he is the war leader. They find out they've been employing some mercenaries called the Grey Swords and that they're led by a one-eyed man that are sworn to like the wolf deities. Surprise, Talk the Younger is back. Or as he's calling himself, Talk the Unlucky at this point. Talk the Younger had his own big surprise. He's like, oh, I wasn't really expecting like this. It's like, you're really surprising everyone. Did you think a mask would just change anything? And they're like, what? And then, boom. Red Mask is actually the first sword of the Kachan Jamal, which another system I'd love to see explored more. But I really like that sort of deck of cards analogy, just... The different suites and how everything relates to it but now you have that red mask is not only a badass all warrior using ancient weapons but now he is somehow also chained to the chain jamal and it sounds like he also doesn't know why so it's just very interesting to have all that mixed back together but so far like i said this was a very slow start for me and getting back into this was kind of rough i am hoping by the midpoint of book two that i'll pick it up more and then you'll see these come out a bit more but i'm still trying to get the rest of this done by the end of this month i still i'm reading other things and you'll see other reviews come out in the meantime but ideally in the next 10 days i can finish this and i may not have all of the edits or the videos put out for each book but i am going to record them just so i'm not going to be tainted by what i think about the rest of them so expect three more videos out for reaper's gale on top of a big condensed review video but Thank y'all for stopping by for this unedited portion. It's going to be weird just to cut out little dead silence and not put memes in here, but we'll see how this video does. But as always, take it easy.